Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewire. Now, 54 years ago, almost to the day that this episode is released, the Falls Curfew saw the British Army besieged a large working class neighbourhood in Belfast in what proved to be pivotal events in the outbreak of the Troubles. The previous episodes in this series explored how hundreds were detained over those three days and thousands were barricaded into their homes. Four people, Charles O'Neill, William Burns, Patrick Elliman, and the focus of this series, Zbigniew of Uglik, were murdered by soldiers of the British Army over that weekend as well. This podcast, the final in the series, Three Days in July, reveals the dark history and cover-up by the security forces to mask what they had done in the Lower Falls in July 1970. Through this show, I'm going to reveal how the victims' families were intimidated, how their loved ones' memories were manipulated and used in a shadowy war of psyops and black propaganda by the British Army to mask the growing numbers of atrocities in the opening phase of the Troubles. Now, this stuff can be hard to get your head around, so I've taken my time with this episode. If you want to learn more about the outbreak of the Troubles, I have a multi-part series now available for show supporters at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. That series is made with Dr. Brian Hanley from the History Department of Trinity College, and it explores the background and build up to the conflict. Now, to become a supporter and get the series, just check out patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Before we start the final episode of Three Days in July, I just want to thank Zbigniew of Ogluk's niece, Martha Rila Stern, for her time and interviews. The series is based on original research on the Falls Curfew by the Belfast writer and journalist Podrick O'Meshkel for a book he's writing. You can find out more about Podrick in the show notes below. Additional narrations are by Aidan Crow, Therese Murray and Sebastian Zimnoch. Thanks to Stephanie Nihirni for her advice and help. And finally, sound is by Kate Dunlee. The summer of 1970 was a time of relentless and sensational news in Britain. By June the 14th, England had coasted their way to the quarterfinals of a World Cup they were predicted to win when they were suddenly beaten by West Germany and knocked out of the competition. Then, four days later, the country went to the polls and, in another major upset, the Conservative Party of Ted Heath won a 42-seat majority when all predictions claimed they would be resoundedly defeated by Labour. The early days of July showed no respite in the dramatic headlines. On Sunday, July 5th, families across the United Kingdom faced depressing headlines after 105 British holidaymakers were among those killed when a plane crashed into what was labelled the Peak of Death, a mountain in the Pyrenees where another plane had crashed just 11 years earlier. Meanwhile, closer to home, stories emerging from Belfast that same weekend seemed incredulous. The British Army had launched a massive military operation in the city, imposing a curfew in the Lower Falls. The first time anything like this had happened in the United Kingdom since the Second World War. As people across Britain opened their newspapers, they read surreal accounts from Belfast. John Sheard, reporting from the city, informed readers of the Sunday Mirror about what he encountered in the streets of the Lower Falls when he and other journalists had been brought into the area by the British Army. I spent 40 minutes yesterday touring the gloomy battered and deserted maze of narrow streets of the Lower Falls. Thousands of people are confined to their houses for 22 hours out of 24. Heavily armoured troops, battered and dirty after Friday night's 10-hour gun battle, ensured that the curfew was kept. Faces pressed into the windows as the army truck in which I travelled rolled through the streets piled with broken paving stones, rocks, broken glass and smashed goods from looted shops. One grimmest army officer said, A curfew is a terrible thing to impose, especially on British soil. But if you impose it, it has to be maintained to the full. In reality, the situation was actually far worse than John Sheard had reported. In the mortuary of the Royal Victoria Hospital in Belfast, there were the bodies of three people shot dead by the British Army, while a fourth man, Patrick Elliman, lay fatally wounded, lingering between life and death. He would eventually pass away on July the 11th. 
But Belfast was far removed from the quietude of England on that Sunday morning, where families could put aside their newspapers and prepare to attend religious services and then sit down to Sunday roasts. However, one family in the city would find themselves plunged into the violence that was sweeping through Northern Ireland that summer. It was at some stage on the Sunday that a police constable called to the door of number 104 Wellesley Road in Chiswick in West London, the home of the Uglick family, one of the thousands of Polish exiles living in Britain since the Second World War. Pavo, the father, aged 60 in 1970, had been imprisoned in a Siberian prisoner of war camp in the early stages of the Second World War before serving in the British Eighth Army in the later stages of the conflict. His wife, Salamia, who was 57 in 1970, had also been imprisoned in Russia during the conflict. However, on that Sunday in July 1970, the constable would break news that would upend and shatter their lives once more. In Belfast, the Royal Ulster Constabulary suspected that one of the bodies in the Royal Victoria Hospital was in fact their 21-year-old son, Zbigniew. The devastating news was followed by what proved to be an agonising wait. It fell to their son-in-law, their daughter Donuta's husband, Roman Bogukski, to travel to Belfast to formally identify the remains. By the Monday morning of July 6th, Roman had flown into Belfast and made his way to the Royal Victoria Hospital in the city. The cold, clinical surroundings, the polished floors, the smell of disinfectant stood in sharp contrast to the surreal situation he faced. He was taken to the mortuary in the hospital and then shown a corpse. At that moment, all hope vanished. Roman was looking at his brother-in-law Zbigniew. However, Roman immediately knew the family had not been told everything, or at least Zbigniew's death was more complicated than they had been led to believe and a lot of questions needed to be answered. Zbigniew's body had been badly beaten. Indeed, his wounds were so grievous that when Roman returned to London, he insisted that his mother-in-law, Salomea, would not look at the body of her son. He would ensure that the coffin remained sealed at the funeral. Although the fatal gunshot wound had been to his abdomen, the wounds Roman saw on Zbigniew's face had been inflicted by British Army soldiers after his death, as covered in the last episode. Now, as the Uglick family reeled from the shock of losing their son at the age of 21, the fact that they could not have an open coffin at Zbigniew's funeral was deeply traumatic. As Roman Bogukski's daughter and Zbigniew's niece, Martha Rila Stern, now explains, The family were denied what were traditional rituals of grieving and mourning, rituals similar to Irish wakes that helped people come to terms with the death of a loved one. My father had been the the one who'd gone out to Ireland to identify the body. And the story was, my mum would say, I don't know why, but he just kept saying to Granny not to, because you would would go and see the body, wouldn't you? Uh, Well... Traditionally, we would see the body, you you say your goodbyes, you say a prayer, whatever. Dad was insistent that my grandma didn't open the casket and didn't see the body. So I'm not quite sure what he did, but he said that the body was not in a good state. Meanwhile, back in London, a post-mortem was carried out on Zbigniew's remains by Dr Derek Carson, the assistant state pathologist for Northern Ireland. Carson would identify the fatal wound had passed through Zbigniew's body. An exit wound was identified in his back. Swabs were taken from his hair and his hands, and although these seemed perhaps routine, they would become significant later on. Finally, on July 10th, exactly a week after he had first come to Belfast, Zbigniew's remains were laid to rest in his native London. His distraught family were bewildered by what had just transpired and declined to comment to journalists in the immediate aftermath. However, they did have many questions that were left unanswered. Who had killed their son? Why had he been killed? And what had happened to his corpse that Roman Bogukski had insisted that his mother-in-law, Salomea, would not look on her son one last time? While the family wanted answers, it quickly became apparent that finding out the truth of what exactly happened in Belfast over those three days in July 1970 which had claimed the lives of four people and traumatised thousands more would be difficult. Indeed, 
When the Irish Times inquired about the victims, the British Army stated, The one definite thing is that the army killed two snipers, one at the junction of Albert Street in the Falls Road, the other at Marchioness Street. Now this claim was demonstrably false. The person killed on Marchioness Street was Patrick Elliman, but he was actually still alive at that point, although mortally wounded in a Belfast hospital. He was described by those who knew him as elderly and asthmatic and clearly wasn't an IRA volunteer. There were numerous eyewitnesses who could testify to the fact that he hadn't been armed and wasn't a sniper. Meanwhile, the person killed at the junction of Albert Street was William Burns, who had been shot at his front door. However, the claims that these men were in the IRA were only the beginning of a campaign of disinformation. Indeed, very different rumours would swirl around Zbigniew Oglik and his family's story of survival from the Second World War, which is covered in episode one of this series, would be weaponized to mask the dark secrets about what had happened in Belfast in early July 1970. Now, before we get into those specific rumours and what is a very murky story, I want to address one other claim that has been something of a distraction over the decades about why Zbigniew was in Belfast. It has been asserted by various people that Zbigniew Oglik was actually a British agent in the city. One of the most notable advocates of this theory was the journalist Tony Geraghty, who made the assertion in his book The Irish War. However, even the most cursory glance at Zbigniew's life reveals it to be entirely implausible. So, Zbigniew Oglik was 21 when he was killed in Belfast. He had been working as a postman. His colleagues and people on his mail round spoke to journalists in the aftermath of his death, testifying to the fact that he had worked in Brentford Post Office. Now, prior to that, he had been enrolled as a student in Chiswick Polytechnic, and before that, he had been in school. He never had time to even join a security agency, let alone gain the experience required before he would be sent to somewhere like the Lower Falls in July 1970. This allegation, entirely false, only distracts from a far more nefarious and coordinated campaign that began at Zbigniew's inquest, which we will cover next. On Wednesday, October the 21st, 1970, Zbigniew Oglick's inquest took place at the Old Belfast Courthouse, located on the Crumlin Road in the city. The inquest was supposed to set out a narrative of what had happened But rather than shed light on Zbigniew's story, it just posed more questions and obfuscated the truth. Those who had interacted with Zbigniew in his 12 or so hours in Belfast testified at the inquest. Andrew Gray gave a detailed account of the time Zbigniew had spent in his house. You've already heard extracts of his testimony in episode 2. Now among the most important witnesses and testimonies was that of Private B the soldier who had fired the fatal shot that killed Zbigniew. The written statement of Private B contained numerous omissions and contradictions which would prove very important in months and years to come. For example, he claimed, I removed the body and took it to Albert Street where it was put aboard a military vehicle and I accompanied it to the Royal Victoria Hospital. Private B will conclude his statement for the inquest with a deeply problematic description of Zbigniew's remains after they were recovered by the British Army. The body was wearing a black polo neck sweater and dark trousers. The face seemed camouflaged with black marks. This was the first time the claim that Zbigniew's face had been camouflaged appeared in the record. Andrew Gray, for example, who had spent several hours with Zbigniew, just prior to his death, made no mention of his face being camouflaged. However, over the course of the inquest, numerous other witnesses would add to what was a heavily distorted picture being painted about what exactly had happened on the night Zbigniew died. For example, a soldier who met Zbigniew at Girdwood Barracks earlier on that Friday evening would claim at his inquest that he thought Zbigniew was, in his words, a young hothead and that there was something phony about him. Now, on a weekend where hundreds of people over 300 in fact, had been arrested in Belfast, it's very difficult to believe that a British Army soldier would not have detained a man he considered to be a hothead and to be something of a phony. However, some of the most controversial evidence at the inquest was presented by Dr Richard Beavis, who had analysed the swabs taken from Zbigniew's hands. 
Beavis found traces of lead on Zbigniew's hands and he would state the following about these traces. As a result of my investigation, I think that it is more probable that the deceased had discharged a firearm than handled a lead object as the traces of lead were granular. Now the final words of his statement are hard to read. It probably says that the traces of lead were granular and not dusty, but in any case his meaning was very clear. Beavis was claiming that Zbigniew had fired a gun on the night he had been killed. Now if this claim were true, it would obviously transform the case. However, there's very little to back up Beavis's claim. Firstly, it's worth noting that he used the words I think and it is probable, not exactly conclusive language. Furthermore, Zbigniew on that same day had first worked in a post office in London delivering mail. Then he had taken a flight to Belfast. Then he had walked through what was effectively an urban war zone before he had been shot. It was also pointed out that as an amateur photographer, he would have been exposed to lead in cameras as well. And earlier on the evening he had been shot, as was covered in episode one, his camera had been opened and the film removed. This could possibly explain the presence of lead on his hands. Perhaps even more importantly though, Andrew Gray, one of the last people to see him alive, never mentioned anything about a weapon at all. Thirdly, and perhaps most significantly, by the army's own admission, no weapon or ammunition was found with or on Zbigniew's body. So if he had actually fired a weapon, where had he done this? And when had he done it? And exactly how had this young Londoner, who had no connections to Belfast and only arrived in the city less than 12 hours earlier, secured a weapon? In my mind, this claim that he fired a gun is just simply not plausible. But what purpose did this narrative being painted The idea that Zbigniew was somehow guilty of something serve. Well, it certainly removed any blame from the British army by casting aspersions on and suspicion around Zbigniew. Indeed, these aspersions were added to in a, I suppose what you might describe as a less than subtle way by the representative of the British army at the inquest, Richard Ferguson. He asked that the names of the soldiers would not be revealed to the public. Now you might argue this is understandable because they might have been targeted by the IRA in Belfast in 1970. But that was not Ferguson's reason. He would provide a very different reason for having the names withheld when he said, I would ask you to withhold the name in case we are dealing with some revolutionary or anarchist group. Indeed, Ferguson, the representative of the British Army at the inquest, would go on to state that the case had, in his words, an international flavour. The quote-unquote international flavour was again a falsehood inserted into the narrative. Zbigniew of Uglick, as we've already seen in this series, was born in Oxfordshire and raised in London. He himself was English, born to Polish parents. Indeed, one of the soldiers at the inquest would testify to the fact that Zbigniew had a London accent. However, it was clear that the army representative, Richard Ferguson, was planting the notion that Zbigniew was an international terrorist, or at the very least, inferring this idea. The coroner, in his concluding remarks, added further but needless doubt over Zbigniew when he would speak of him in a highly disrespectful manner. These were the coroner's words. It is most tragic that a young hothead would get himself into this situation, and it is certainly a warning to everybody. Now, the verdict of the inquest was one of misadventure. Essentially, this meant that Zbigniew's death was an accident. The verdict exonerated the British Army of any responsibility. Before we move on, it's also worth stating that there was a very clear omission at the inquest, insofar as that there was no reference to the desecration of Zbigniew's body after his death, which had been witnessed by the journalist Tony Gerty. Now, while the inquest had inferred that Zbigniew at best had died through an accident and perhaps was engaged in a gun battle with the British Army, The inquest became part of a very sinister, coordinated campaign against the wider Uglick family. When I spoke to Martha Rila Stern, Zbigniew's niece, she revealed a particularly harrowing experience that his parents faced in the aftermath of his death when they were visited by members of the security forces. Martha was a very young child during these events, but as you'll hear, Zbigniew's death would haunt her family for decades. She now recalls what her grandparents endured in the aftermath of their son's death and how the security forces asked about him in an accusatory way and wondered if an Irish lodger who the family had had somehow influenced him. They had gentlemen come through from either 
MI5 or special branch or whoever it was to come and interview them with specific questions around did he have communist sympathies who did he know um who had he spoken to and they asked about um the lodger as well so lots of what connections did he have with the irish and obviously being catholic you know they're assuming their sim- his sympathies lie with the republicans so yeah the the interviews themselves were very threatening so in terms of they were set interviewed separately Okay. And quite aggressively. That is what I understood. Um, the solicitor that they engaged to help them find answers prior to the inquest, he was threatened. And he was told, don't rock the boat, don't ask any more questions. And he was told to recommend to my grandparents not to take the matter further. Christmas 1970 must have been an extremely difficult time for the Oglick family. Salamea and Pavau had endured so much in their lives, and when they had brought their family to Britain, they presumably hoped that they would find protection and peace there. But in July, Zbigniew had been gunned down by soldiers from the very army Pavau had fought for in the Second World War. However, even though Zbigniew was dead, the family would not be allowed to grieve in peace. Over a year after his death, in later 1971, the security forces would inflict further trauma on the Oglik family by using Zbigniew in black propaganda. In what is a dark twist to this story, Zbigniew's memory would be used in psychological operations, sometimes known as PSYOPs, during the unfolding conflict in the North, which we'll cover next. Over a year after Zbigniew had been killed, his story began to reappear in several publications, but some details have been changed intentionally. Now, the first publication to carry this new version of events was the People newspaper, which ran a story under the headline, Russians backed IRA men. The article beneath this headline went on to detail supposed Russian plans to discredit Britain in the eyes of the world by fermenting unrest in Northern Ireland. The article also claimed that this was a plan to keep NATO troops pinned down in Northern Ireland so they couldn't be used elsewhere. In a pretty ludicrous narrative, it also claimed that British communists were being sent to Northern Ireland to train the IRA. In an attempt to prove this claim, Zbigniew was used as evidence as links between the Soviet Union and the IRA. The following is an excerpt from the article in The People. Although his name is written incorrectly, his surname comes first, then his first name, this is the way it appeared in the original story. For the first time, security officers revealed the story behind the shooting of one man killed as an IRA sniper in July last year. He was a naturalised Pole named Uglik Zbigniew, a 21-year-old postman living in London. On July 2nd, Zbigniew flew to Belfast. Soon after he arrived, a gun battle broke out in the Catholic Falls Road area. Next morning, he was shot as he climbed over rooftops wearing a black sweater with blackened face and carrying a rifle. According to security men, Zbigniew had also been involved in the Paris student riots and he was a known communist. In an additional and supporting column beside this article, the People newspaper also detailed a wider Russian plot to foment a revolution in Ireland. Now, these stories transformed Zbigniew's case, and the reader was almost left with the impression that the entire Falls curfew and what had happened in Belfast over those three days in July had been started by Soviet agents, of whom Zbigniew was one. However, this story from start to finish was pure fantasy. Zbigniew, for example, was described as a naturalised Pole, and Poland at the time was a communist country and a member of the Warsaw Pact a military alliance headed by the Soviet Union. So Zbigniew, being a Pole, obviously provided a connection. However, the truth of the matter was that Zbigniew had been born in Oxfordshire, raised in London, and had never been to Poland in his life. That article was also the first time it was ever claimed Zbigniew had been carrying a rifle. He hadn't. Both the RUC, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, and the British Army had been categorical at the inquest that this was not the case. No gun or ammunition had been found with Zbigniew's body. 
Finally, the article would also assert that Zbigniew was a communist. I'm going to come back to that later on because that was very distressing for the Uglik family. Now, nearly all the claims in these articles in the People newspaper came from unnamed security sources. The only individual whose name was provided was a person called J. Bernard Hutton. While he didn't mention Zbigniew in the article, the People newspaper used him as a source for wider Russian plans for Northern Ireland. Now, his name should have raised red flags from the get-go and it reveals the complete lack of substance in these claims forwarded by the People newspaper. So J. Bernard Hutton was a former communist who had made a name for himself as an expert on Soviet and communist spies and espionage. However, his books on these subjects have been exposed as fabrications. Modern historians across the political spectrum, from Richard Evans to Rupert Allison, have used words such as pure invention and splendidly fanciful tale to describe Hutton's works. Even in 1970, Hutton was a highly questionable character. That same year, he had released a book called On the Other Side of Reality, in which he claimed to be a time traveller. Now, while his name alone should have raised questions and should have been enough to discredit the story, similar stories would appear in the press over the following weeks. By mid-October, three articles were printed in Belfast claiming the Soviet government in Russia was behind the growing conflict in the region. These articles were written by John Rooks. His name will be significant later. But the third of the three articles named Zbigniew and asked readers to remember what was called the mysterious Mr. Uglik before alleging Zbigniew was part of a European communist conspiracy. Now, the appearance of these stories about Zbigniew in newspapers 14 months after he had been killed, on the face of it, just seems odd. Over 80 people have been killed in the troubles in the north since Zbigniew had been shot and the violence was escalating. You'd think there was plenty to write about. However, the escalating violence was precisely the reason why Zbigniew's story was starting to reappear. It wasn't an accident. By late 1971, the situation in Northern Ireland was clearly escalating and the death toll was spiralling. The British Army were increasingly being drawn into a conflict and their responses were only making the situation worse. Internment without trial had been introduced in August 1971 and this saw hundreds of people detained. Opposition to this measure had led to what was known as the Bally Murphy Massacre, during which the British Army shot and killed 11 civilians. But the army were not just engaged in a physical war on the streets of Belfast and the towns and cities across the north of Ireland. In January 1972, the British Prime Minister of the day, Ted Heath, had written, It has to be remembered that we are, in Northern Ireland, fighting not only a military war, but a propaganda war. Now this propaganda dimension of the war had been taking shape, on the British side at least, through 1971. In mid-June of that year, now this is 1971, an individual called Hugh Mooney from the Foreign Office's Information Research Department had arrived in Belfast and began working from an office in Stormont Castle. Now Mooney is a key figure in this story, as is the innocuous sounding Information Research Department. So it's worth introducing the man and then that organisation who would play a very sinister role in something called PSYOPs in Belfast in the early 1970s. Hugh Peter Mooney was born in the early 20th century to an Irish family in Britain. He studied in Trinity College Dublin and then went on to enjoy a successful career as a journalist in the 1960s. Starting out with the Irish Times, he then went on to work for the news agency Reuters, reporting on the revolt against British rule in Aden in 1966, and then subsequently on the Arab-Israeli War in 1967. By 1969, he was working for the BBC, when he left to take up a position for the Foreign Office's Information Research Department. Now that Information Research Department was a British organisation that dated back to the late 1940s and had been established to counter communist propaganda emanating from the Soviet Union. However, in the 1950s and 60s, it began to diversify its targets and undermined national liberation movements seeking independence from the British Empire by running propaganda against them. However, its DNA and modus operandi remained rooted 
in anti-communist propaganda, which had been its original purpose. And even though its targets changed, it continued to use anti-communist rhetoric to undermine national liberation movements. Now, around 1970, this information research department was becoming increasingly drawn into the escalating conflict in Northern Ireland, where their aim was to overtly and covertly blacken the IRA. Now, Hugh Mooney arrived in Belfast in mid-June in the summer of 1971, and he would work closely with a British Army soldier, Colin Wallace, who was, by his own admission, a psychological warfare expert, and he worked in something called the Information Policy Unit. Now, these extremely dull titles of Information Research Department and Information Policy Unit were intentionally banal to distract from their real purpose. The work that Hugh Mooney and Colin Wallace were doing were separate and distinct from the Army Press Office. While the Press Office provided official answers, the Information Policy Unit that these men were working with shaped narratives in a more secretive fashion. Details of what was a secret propaganda war that these two were engaged in have been released in recent years through the declassification of documents and the Savile Inquiry into the massacre of 13 civilians in Derry on Bloody Sunday in January 1972. Colin Wallace, for example, would reveal the view of the wider British intelligence community in the early 70s when he said, There was a paranoia about a worldwide communist conspiracy. The paranoia took on a level of importance which it did not merit. Now Hugh Mooney, having cut his teeth in the information research department, was certainly one of these paranoid individuals that Colin Wallace was referring to. After arriving in Belfast in June 1971, he set about building links with media outlets and using his connections within the intelligence community began to plant stories which focused on supposed communist connections in the IRA. Within three and a half months in Belfast, he was reporting back to London that he was enjoying a degree of success that he had not anticipated. One example he cited was an article that appeared in the Belfast newsletter on September the 21st, 1971, called Red Menace is Real in Ulster Riots. Significantly, this was around the same time that the article in the British newspaper The People that attacked Zbigniew Vuglik's memory had first appeared. Indeed, in terms of the stories that sullied Zbigniew's memory, Hugh Mooney's report to his superiors in the Foreign Office in the autumn of 1971 would be very clear when he said, I am also in touch with John Rooks, editor of the Belfast Telegraph, who should publish a piece shortly, giving the long-established communist links of certain key members of the IRA. I also steered Mr Rooks to the head of the special branch to make inquiries about the increased activity of the Northern Ireland Communist Party. He would conclude, There is tremendous scope for much more of this kind of work. Now, the timing of this report was critical. It covered work between June and September and it was presumably written in the last days of September or early October 1971. Less than two weeks later, on the 12th to the 14th of October 1971, John Rooks, the editor of the Belfast Telegraph, the same individual that Hugh Mooney had mentioned in his report, published three articles on the communist links to the IRA. The third and final of these articles would make spurious allegations against Zbigniew Vuglik. It essentially claimed that he was the embodiment of the link between the Soviet Union and the IRA. It seems very likely that Hugh Mooney was the one who provided these details to John Rooks, the editor of the Belfast Telegraph. It could also have been the special branch in Belfast. However, the fact that Zbigniew's name also appeared in The People, an English newspaper, would suggest that the story was being orchestrated by Mooney, who had a national focus rather than the regionally focused special branch in Belfast. So we have to ask, why were they going to all these lengths? Strange as it sounds, it actually had nothing to do with Zbigniew at all. He was just used, or at least his memory was being used. The intention was, as I've said, to forge supposed links between the IRA and the Soviet Union. And one of the targets of this black propaganda was the Catholic community in Ireland. The notion that the IRA were merely stooges of the communist Soviet Union would not rest easy with more conservative Catholics in the nationalist community across Ireland. On a broader level, it also helped obscure the very real underlying causes of the conflict, and that was the stark inequality that had existed in Northern Ireland since its inception. Now, to what degree the journalist John Rooks was aware of this propaganda is very difficult to know. It may well have been that he simply believed what he was told because it fitted with his own worldview and he was unaware that he was being duped. 
Indeed, journalists were manipulated all the time, particularly in the early phase of the Troubles. In 1990, the journalist Martin Dillon, who was reporting on the conflict in this period, would reflect in his book, The Dirty War. The use of dirty tricks in Northern Ireland have been accepted by many journalists who were fed false information. I was one of those journalists. And while writing about the overall conflict in the early 1970s, I accepted a story from the Army press desk, which I later discovered was manufactured to discredit the IRA. I did not realise for some time that I had been used. While it might seem innocuous or certainly not as bad as some of the things that happened during the Troubles, this campaign took an immense toll on the Uglick family back in London. Martha Rila Stern revealed the family's background, their experiences of the Second World War, their incarceration in Siberia, and then their remarkable odyssey to Britain. This infused Zbigniew's parents, Pavel and Salamia, with an intense opposition to communism and the Soviet Union in Russia. They were outraged by these claims about Zbigniew, and Zbigniew's father, Pavel, would actually write to the People newspaper, the first publication to run the story, asking for a correction. May I point out that my son, Zbigniew, was not a communist working as an IRA sniper and was not carrying a gun when he was shot and killed. Like many other Poles, my wife and I suffered gravely at the hands of the Russians and we are grateful for the refuge accorded to us in England. Our son, British-born, shared our views of the communists it is clear from the inquest evidence that in visiting Belfast, my son was living out of a fantasy. The imputation in your report that he was a communist has pained both his mother and me, and in addition, given rise to unfortunate comment among neighbours and workmates. Pavel's letter highlighted the pain and anguish that the campaign that used the big nave to try and concoct false narratives about what was happening in Belfast in the 70s had on the Uglick family. From a distance of 54 years, the experience of the Uglick family can seem strange and unusual, even unique in terms of the Troubles. Zbigniew's story is often depicted as an odd anecdote to the wider history of the conflict. He was a young Londoner, sometimes even called Polish, who had wandered into Belfast in 1970 and was shot dead a few hours later. However, his story and what happened to the Uglick family afterwards wasn't unusual. The murder of Zbigniew of Uglick and then the treatment of his family was an early example of how the security forces would treat victims and their families during the Troubles. In Derry, a few months after the smear campaign against Zbigniew of Uglick's memory, the British army killed 13 people on what is known as Bloody Sunday. Hugh Mooney was one of those drafted in to craft the army's response to the massacre where they would try to depict the victims as having been armed volunteers engaged in a gun battle. It would take nearly five decades of relentless campaigning by the families of the Bloody Sunday victims before a public inquiry would confirm this to be a lie. In researching this story, one thing that stood out to me was how the psychological operations and black propaganda worked. I think we all have images of evil villains or almost James Bond type characters that work behind the scenes arranging these stories. However, this distorts the reality of the people behind these campaigns. Hugh Mooney, from what I can gather, was a very ordinary person. He was not a soldier, he worked in an office in Hillsborough Castle, and he may never even have fired a gun. And when he died in 2017, an online obituary described him in the following terms, journalist, diplomat, barrister, teacher and writer. It all sounds terribly respectable. The term diplomat probably refers to his career in the Foreign Office Information Research Department. But the campaign Hugh Mooney orchestrated damaged lives, lives of innocent people, and the Uglick family in London were one of them. I said earlier that the campaign orchestrated in the media was not about Zbigniew at all. And when I said this, I'm not trying to write him out of his own history, but it struck me that people like Hugh Mooney didn't care about the impact they had on the Oglick family or Zbigniew's memory. The documents which I have relied on in this podcast in which Hugh Mooney reported back to London about how he planted the story of Russian involvement was actually highlighted in the Bloody Sunday inquiry by Hugh Mooney himself. I suspect he would have scarcely even remembered who Zbigniew was or gave second thought 
to weaponizing the memory, history and experiences of his family against them. But these campaigns, as I say, caused terrible distress and pain for a family who were grieving. When I spoke to Martha Rila Stern, she spoke about how Zbigniew's father, Pavo, would have felt about the Soviet Union and what the claims that his son was a communist would have meant to him. Because it was under communists that his people, as far as he was concerned, had suffered the most, that they had caused or they had committed such atrocities like Katyn and all of those places where tens of thousands of Polish officers were, were murdered. It was He was extremely anti-communism. Anti in, oh, you wouldn't even believe how anti, honestly. He would, he never spoke Russian again. Not even, you know, if my granny was being a bit of a show off and and telling us what this was or that was in Russian, he would never. He said, I'm not going to speak that language. I'm not going to, I don't want to hear it in this house. Yeah. He was very anti communism, anti communist, anti socialist, anti, you know, Quite frankly, had he been allowed to vote, he'd be a conservative, I think. (laughs) That's why it was so upsetting, Finn, I think, that they had accused him of being. And, uh, you know, and as far as my grandfather was concerned, that he had fought the fascists and the communists. And what the hell did he fight it for? How could they say such a horrible thing about his son? That's that was the whole attitude. While the Uglicks were bewildered and traumatised by what had happened, across the north of Ireland, the Falls curfew would, over time, just become one of a series in a catalogue of incidents as the list of victims in the Troubles mounted. Trauma was layered upon trauma. However, for the Uglick family, it was obviously the events of those three days in July which remained central to their lives. Martha recalls how visiting Zbigniew's grave was a feature of family life and also how Zbigniew's loss was remembered by wider Polish society in London. We're Catholic, so obviously there would be anniversary masses. And then at All Souls, you then go and you prepare the grave, you tidy it up, and then your local parish priest, your Polish parish priest, um, would come and then he'd say a prayer over the grave. And that would happen every year, but they would go regularly to Um, tidy up the grave they would visit him and remember him and say a little prayer but as you said there would be remembrance masses he was very popular you see he was very involved with this polish scouting association and i don't it's it, it i don't know how to stress but it is in london and in birmingham and wherever these polish communities post war polish communities were these these Polish scouting associations were like the hub of where all the young people would meet. And from there, they would have um, youth groups and they'd have dances and they would have. It was like this 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 separate world within within a general sort of within London. And he he was a scout leader and he was very popular. And for years, somebody used to leave white roses on his grave but we would find them, but nobody knows who it was. However, the gap in family life left by Zbigniew's murder remained their entire lives. Pavo and Salomea passed away in 2005 within 10 days of each other. Salomea first, then Pavo. Here Martha talks about how, when Salomea suffered from dementia in her later years, this often left her reliving the trauma of not knowing what happened to Zbigniew and the fact she had not seen Zbigniew's body after he had been killed. Because obviously then you relive certain past things quite clearly. And yes, nobody would tell her what had happened to her son, and and she wasn't allowed to see him. Even though Martha was only a child when these events took place, it had a profound impact on her throughout her life. She was intimidated to such an extent that even today she still has reservations about making inquiries about what happened to Zbigniew. My dad, before he passed, was saying, you try and find out, see what you can find out, but be careful, you know. And if you hear that, I mean, can you imagine hearing that most of your life? And there's nothing to be afraid of. (laughs) And yet, you know, looking at it, just I still I can't get the courage to make a freedom of information request for a copy of the coroner's report, the full report to which 
you know, as a member of the family, I can I should be able to get hold of or or, you know, just a some sort of copy of what this whole interview was about and why. Uh, you know, I still can't do that. I just in the back of my head are all the warnings. And it really was growing up with this sense of we don't tell other people about it. We don't talk about it. We don't want any trouble. And that's what it was. But nobody would give them answers and nobody's ever going to give them answers. And that was literally what was said. They were foreigners. We don't matter. And they're not going to give us answers. It's horrible. But it was very conflicting because I just assumed until I found out to the contrary that he'd been shot by an IRA sniper. As Martha already mentioned, the Ugliks were somewhat isolated in their grief in London because they felt they couldn't talk about what had happened. Certainly, there were few in London that would have been able to relate to their experience. However, unknown to the family, Zbigniew was remembered by others. Although little was known about him in Belfast, the community remembered the young Londoner each year when they recalled the Falls curfew of July 1970. When a plaque recalling those events was erected on the Falls Road in Belfast, it listed the four people killed, including Zbigniew, with the words, Murdered by the British Army during the Falls curfew of July 3rd to 5th, 1970. The curfew was finally broken by the courage and determination of the women of Belfast. When Martha discovered that Zbigniew was remembered in Belfast, it had a huge impact on her. I'm just so pleased that those all those people remembered him and there were masses and people lit candles. And I came across a sort of a, a Facebook remembrance site and he happened to be on there. Then they were they were remembering, I think it was the 4th of July, and they were happened to have remember him on that particular day. And I think if my grandparents had known this, or if I had I'd started looking sooner, then maybe I could have said or at least could have said to them, look, he's not forgotten, not in Ireland. People mm. in, have remembered him in Ireland. When we spoke, I asked Martha what she would like to see happen now. I would like his death certificate to reflect the true cause of death, not death by misadventure, but unlawful killing. And I would like to know who the gentleman was who took that shot just to understand, to be able to ask, he's probably passed away, to ask him, well, why did you, why? Why were you so frightened? <laughs> what was it? And just for someone to tell the truth for a change, that would be quite nice. And just to give this information freely, because I was pretty sure that um, each of the deaths starting back in nine. When uh, 68, 69, was to be, each case was to be reopened, re examined. And I'm pretty sure that they they would have looked at Spishek's one because it was one of the earlier deaths at that time, wasn't it? But I don't even know whether they even got to, to looking at that or reviewing that case. Ultimately, that's what I would like. I would like, because the death certificate is a legal document, it's a historical document, and it should tell the truth. I don't think we're really ever going to find out why they decided to cover it up or why they weren't honest or what was so terrible about being honest about it and saying he was shot by accident by someone who was too young to be there or who'd been, um, uh, what's the word, sort of G'd up by some some senior officer. But because he was so close to the edge of that zone, he just Mm. needed to go from Albert Street, is it, to cross to the cathedral and then he was out of the zone? To finish the episode and this series, I want to return to Belfast one final time because Zbigniew's story is interwoven with the city, its history and the trauma it has endured in the later 20th century and indeed before. Sadly, his story is not unique in Belfast. The Ballymurphy Massacre and Bloody Sunday are perhaps two better known instances where victims of state violence were then in various ways blamed for their own murders. When I visited Belfast to record pieces for this series, the writer and journalist Padre Gormeshkel, who you've heard from throughout the series, brought me to a place called Percy Street. Now we talked about the history of this street in episode one. 54 years ago, mobs from the loyalist Shankill Road poured down Percy Street onto the Falls Road, burning houses and attacking a school, St. Congles. But while we stood there in the 2020s, 
Podrick spoke about the legacy of the conflict in Belfast. Percy Street has now what is called a peace wall, a huge wall that divides the street in two, separating the loyalist Shankill Road from the nationalist Falls Road. As Podrick looked at the wall, he explained the legacy of the conflict in these powerful words. We live parallel existences in this city, and it's not a big city, but people who, including myself, who live in it, We'll, we'll live in existence, which maybe means that half of that, you don't have a, a life within half of it um, because there are no family members there. You don't play sport there. You don't socialise there. And that's still the re- I mean, it, that's the reality of Belfast in 2023. And to finish, Podrick returned to the Falls curfew and summed up the injustice at the heart of this story when a state which claimed it was there to protect its citizens, murdered civilians, then lied about what it had done, and in the case of Zbigniew, used him to cover up for their crimes. Podrick detailed this and explained what a step towards some sense of justice would be. The state which claims the right to protect you murders you, and and they can't just walk away and say, yes, we did this, because then the whole narrative about power then implodes. So they have to also engage in the violence of words and the violence of narrative in the sense of, well, we did this because A, B and C. I mean, this person was suspect and we needed to, to put an end to this person or else this person shouldn't have been when they were at that time, even if it was their own street, but they had lived their own life, their whole life. And this is what happened with the four victims of the curfew. And the, so whenever the inquests were heard later in 1970, the term misadventure was put against all their names. And misadventure is like a, it's a quaint Victorian legal term for your demise is your own fault. If your own fault, you were killed. And so for the last 50 years, the families of, the, of these four civilians have, have been laboring under that. Whatever their attitude to the British state and the British government, the record still states that, that these people were killed because it was their own fault. And so one of the, the sort of few, few legal avenues that's been opened to them is, is the tentatively explore the idea of getting those inquest verdicts overturned, but it wasn't their own fault that they were killed. Um, they never had to be in their own street and in their own country at that time. Now on Monday the 18th of September 2023, the Conservative government in London passed the Northern Ireland Troubles Legacy and Reconciliation Bill. This was condemned internationally by victims and support groups as it effectively shut down the possibility to reopen inquests such as the Big Naves. Now, this episode is being released just as the UK goes to the polls in an election on July 4th, 2024. This is predicted to usher in a Labour government who have pledged to overturn this legacy bill. Time will tell whether they honour this promise, but if they do, this would open the possibility that Zbigniew's case could be re-looked at again. Over the last three episodes, you've been listening to Three Days in July, written researched and narrated by myself, Finn DeWire. A special thanks to Martha Rila Stern for sharing her family history and Padraig Meshkel, upon whose original research for a book he's writing on the Falls Curfew the series was based. You can find links and contact details for Padraig in the show notes below. I'll be back on Saturday with a bonus episode on something completely different. Until then, Sloan. <laughs>